Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so we can get going. Are there any questions on, on rabies or the arena viruses or the Marburg Ebola group? I'm sorry, you know, there are a lot of viruses to cover in this, and I'm trying to give you some generalizations to hang on. Okay. okay. So um, we're going to change tempo somewhat, although rabies has already started to change it for us, and just talk about some of these viral diseases of the central nervous system that have very long incubation periods. So we've already talked about some of these, and I'm just pulling them together here. So some of this is just going to be quick review. Um, but typically these so-called slow viral diseases are because the tempo of the clinical disease is very long. So it takes a long time for the original infection until you see this um, central nervous system disease. Um, so there's a protracted incubation period. There's frequently a protracted course of disease, so the disease can, is not a sort of rapid one or two day affair. It's weeks or months or sometimes years. And you often get multiple neurological symptoms, very nonspecific. So some of these uh, can be confused with rabies-type symptoms. And, and again, some of these are not uh, realized exactly what they were until post-mortem. Uh, and it says due to, some of these are due to viruses. And, and so these are typical agents like um, SV40 and PML, we've already talked about. Measles virus and SSPE, we've already talked about. Rubella and... PRP, we've already talked about, we've already talked about rabies this morning. Uh, but then there's the so-called atypical agents, and these are what we call prions. Uh, and in humans, they cause a variety of diseases that we're going to discuss at the end, including Kuru and Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Let's just briefly go, and most of this is going to be reviewed because I've already introduced these things um, over the, the ones that are due to, to some of these that are due to viruses. Um, Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, hereafter known as PML, uh, is uh, associated with members of the polyomavirus family. Um, typically, one of the ones that's involved is called JC, um, after the initials of one of the early patients. <coughs> um, it's a progressive, usually fatal disease, so once you start seeing the symptoms, uh, it's very difficult uh, the patient normally just progresses inevitably. However, um, a heart may help in AIDS patients, and we'll come back to this. Uh, but the, the thing is, this disease seems to be associated with immune suppression. So if you can get the immune system back up, uh, then you can maybe slow the progression somewhat. That, this is still under investigation. Um, it's a non-inflammatory disease, and it's associated with demyelination, demyelination uh, of the oligodendrocytes. And I think, yes, uh, so you get this really nasty-looking thing because the nerves are just being destroyed, the myelin sheaths are being destroyed. So the symptoms are the kind of things that you might expect if you're just losing brain mass, weakness, speech problems, cognitive problems, headaches, problems walking, problems seeing, sensory loss, seizures, or very miserable, uh, um, a big problem, uh, but not terribly specific to uh, any particular disease. Um, but th this is a non-inflammatory disease. As, as I say, it's associated with, for some reason, these, these sheaths fall apart under this viral attack. <coughs> It appears to be due to the reactivation of the latent infection with these polyomaviruses. So it turns out that the, about 70 to 80% of the population are seropositive for these viruses. Most of us never, as far as we're aware, we're not aware of any disease when we got them. I mean, maybe we had some kind of off day or something, or we, but we have no idea. Um, so we seem to be infected with these without being aware of what they cause or if they caused anything. Uh, and most of us ap apparently never suffer again. Uh, but under certain circumstances where there's immune suppression, then these viruses can uh, come out of wherever they've been hiding out, start replicating, and cause disease. Uh, and in this case, for this JC-like group of viruses, this is in the brain uh, and, and attacks the oligodendrocytes. <coughs> 
And this was an extremely rare disease. Another of these things that I wonder, you know, you're going to... You'll never see this in your lifetime in all probability because the frequency was about 1 in 10 million. So the chances of you ever meeting this. And now the horrifying thing is, you know, I see people and they're just doing a residency over at Richland and they see multiple cases. So it's gone from being an incredibly rare disease to not being so rare at all. And a lot of that, some of it is due to transplant, but very, most of it is due to AIDS. Um, so in AIDS patients, the frequency of developing this is 1 in 20. So you can see how high the frequency now is. So this is one of these viruses that was regarded as being kind of negligible and um, just extremely rare. And now, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of it. And as I say, in AIDS patients, it seems if you give heart treatment, um, you can restore some of the immune system uh, and you can apparently bring this somewhat under control, so at least slow the course. And there have been some claims that maybe you can even get some improvement. Um, while I'm on this, uh, this whole scenario, given its current frequency uh, and the problems that it's causing, um, has sort of raised our awareness of what of some of these other viruses and also the realization that these DNA viruses can somehow stay in some cell or other uh, and then reactivate. And we don't know where it hangs out or why it hangs out or how it hangs out. Uh, but these, this JC virus it seems to hang out in the brain. Uh, but we have another one and I'm just going to mention it here because it may be something that becomes a major feature and it may be something that just dies away. But BK virus is another member of the polyoma group and it also stays latent. It also reactivates under immune suppression. Uh, and you get urinary tract infections due to it and that can actually be a problem with kidney transplants um, because you don't know that the donor has got it but of course you put them into the recipient, they're treated with immune suppression uh, and you find that this reactivates and they can get kidney infections due to this. So this is quite often seen in kidney transplant patients. So it appears to hang out in the kidney and under immune suppression things, it can reactivate in the kidney. And again, not very pleasant, uh, but uh, now there has been a recent claim this year and I don't know how much this is going to hold up, uh, but there has been a claim that it seems to be present and active in, in cases of prostate cancer. So there's some idea is, could this, after all, this is a DNA virus, it, polyoma viruses cause tumors in mice, could it contribute to tumors in human and could it be a contributing factor for prostate cancer? The answer is not in, um, but I'm just raising that onto your screen because this is something that may come out to be uh, a major problem in future years. So we just don't know where we are with this. Uh, at the moment, it's just started. But there are some... Of course, the other possibility is that the conditions in prostate cancer change the conditions so that this virus can reactivate. Measles virus... So were there any questions on the polyoma viruses? Uh, measles virus, we've already talked about subacute acute sclerosing panencephalitis. This is an inflammatory disease. You see perivascular coupling, all that sort of thing. It's caused by a defective virus, so you can't isolate infectious measles from the brain of these patients. Uh, but if you provide a helper virus, uh, you can recover it. And you can find the sequences now that we've got PCR-type things. It takes a good few years. It may even be longer. Uh, one to ten years is sort of average, but uh, it's been even longer. Um, it seems early infection with measles is a risk factor, maybe because the measles gets more readily in the brain. But if you remember, when I talked about mumps and measles, these childhood paramyxovirus infections, both of them have got a remarkability. I think I'm suffering from one of these things. Uh, both of them have got a remarkability, remarkable ability to get to the brain. Um, and so you often see, with mumps, you often see a, 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 an encephalitis, which is really a major problem, but it's clear that these viruses can get to the brain. Uh, and somehow it seems that this can get to the brain, hang out as a defective virus. It's a rare complication, although recent studies have suggested it's 
may be about 10 times as common as was originally thought, but the vaccine, fortunately, seems to protect us not only against measles, but against this SSPE. So the number of cases of SSPE have gone down as vaccination has gone up. Any questions on that? I think we've already covered that. Rubella, we've already covered much the same story, very rare, um, but progress, you get a progressive rubella panencephalitis. It's an inflammatory disease. You get it years after the original infection. It's often associated with congenital infection or very early infections, just the same story as we see with measles, although uh, measles I'm not so aware of congenital, but uh, with rubella congenital. And it's very, very rare, and it also seems to be associated with a defective virus. Uh, so just for the sateness sake of completeness there. So are there any questions on those? Mainly review, I think. Okay. Um, so now I want to get on to prion diseases, which have various names because nobody's 100%. Well, certain people are sure they know what causes it, but if you take the average scientific position at the moment, I would say most people um, are now tending towards the idea that these are infectious proteins. But the but we are still flexible about exactly what these agents are because we really don't understand everything about them. Um, they have got various names. Uh, the popular one at the moment is prion disease. Uh, the PR reflects that these are uh, transmitted, we think, by infectious proteins as opposed to virions, which are transmitted by infectious viruses. So here, uh, these are commonly known these days as prion diseases, but the other names still, are still used. Um, they cause an encephalopathy. Again, it's not an inflammatory situation. Um, and it's subacute, uh, well, it uh, tends to be long drawn out. And what you get is this spongiform appearance. And they're transmissible diseases. And so this long thing just describes that. They also have got, um, they, you get amyloid material formed, uh, and that's also, so they're known as the transmissible cerebral amyloidoses as well. Um, here is a brain, a section of brain from somebody with one of these diseases, uh, and you can see this spongiform, vacuolated appearance in the brain. Um, you also get this kind of plaque stuff, it stains. Amyloid refers to starch. It stains for carbohydrates. There are a lot of diseases, as you already know, uh, where you get amyloid deposits, and they can be due to a variety of things. Uh, and here, this is an, a glycoprotein deposit, uh, and it's the glycoprotein that stains with these. They have typical, these deposits have typical features in, in the microscope, particularly the Polaroid microscope and staining features. So you get these amyloid, but this isn't the same as the amyloid that you get in Alzheimer's. It's just yet another carbohydrate protein deposit. So what diseases do these prion-type diseases cause? In the human, um, they cause a disease called Kuru, which I hope to mention briefly. Um, diseases called uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob, and then there's a whole pile of syndromes. They're relatively rare, but um, you meet them. Uh, gersman straussler schenker syndrome, commonly known as GSS. Fatal familiar insomnia, FFI. There was an article in one of the newspapers about this the other day. It got it completely wrong, but um, it's actually had a book written on it recently. But whoever reviewed the book didn't seem to understand much about the basis of the disease, unfortunately. Um, uh, or the book didn't, but I, I suspect the reviewer maybe. Uh, and variant CJD, which is um, thought to have got into the human population from, from a bovine disease caused by one of these viruses called bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And um, I may be more concerned about this than you lot because um, the cows went down with BSE in Britain uh, and... All the health authorities said, don't worry, don't worry, it's safe to eat beef. And now it's clear that some people who ate beef uh, came down with this human variant. It seemed to get into the human population. Uh, and it's got some variant features which I'm going to mention. Uh, <coughs> uh, unfortunately, I ate beef during the period that these cows were going around 
with this problem. But still, um, the animals, as I said, this BSE, which is the bovine one, mink get it, elk get a variant of the disease, deer get a variant of the disease. Um, one thing that people wonder is, you know, do hunters who eat these animals get these diseases? We really don't know very much about how, how animals can transmit it to humans. Where there has been a lot of evidence is on scrapie and sheep. And so um, there are countries where the sheep have no scrapie. There are no flocks with scrapie in. And there are countries where you have flocks with high levels of scrapie. If you look at the incidence of these diseases in the human population, you don't see any differences between countries where the sheep have scrapie and countries where they don't. So the feeling is that sheep scrapie is not a serious contribution to human versions of these diseases, even when these sheep are being widely used uh, as meat in those countries. So sheep, the sheep version doesn't seem to cross very readily into humans. The bovine version doesn't seem to cross very readily, but it does seem to cross much more than we think the sheep does. I'll come back to, because so much of the original work was done on sheep, you need to be familiar that scrapie is one of these. So they're atypical agents. They don't look like typical viruses. Uh, um, why don't they? Well, they're similar to viruses, which is why I get to cover them, because they're small. Um, they will go through a filter, the kind of filter that was traditionally used to distinguish between bacteria and viruses. They need host cells to grow. They've got no machinery for energy, energy generation or protein synthesis. They look just like a virus in all those. But they don't look like a virus in other ways. Um, we can't find detectable virions. Uh, people have looked long and hard, and nobody's found anything that looks like a typical virion. Um, and you can't find virions. If you purify the infectious material from these brains, you still can't find anything that looks like a virus particle in it. And you can use things that would inactivate nucleic acid, ultraviolet light, irradiation, various chemicals. Uh, and they seem totally resistant to these things. So um, if the nucleic acid is present, it's so small that these things just, if you've got a big target, you can hit it in multiple places. If you've got a tiny target, it's much harder to hit it. So if it's, if it's there, it's so small that it's so hard to hit that it's difficult to inactivate. And they're very resistant to any of the kinds of inactivation that you can use on most viruses. So th they, that's a major problem. And this realization has changed a lot of surgical practice. So, so some of those things, and again, I, you don't need to learn all of these, but they are resistant or only partially inactivated by things like formaldehyde or ethanol. And in fact, um, I don't know the current status of practice amongst pathologists, but certainly a few years ago, uh, one of the things was uh, that you, for suspected cases of this for brain slices, you stored them in formaldehyde for a very long time before you examined them much longer than you would regularly. And actually, uh, one case, that turned out to be rabies, and it wasn't until much later, you know, the pathologist eventually went to examine these brain sizes to see if they were spongiform, uh, and it turned out they had negri bodies, and they were, they were rabies. And so this isn't a case of you go back and treat the rabies months after the original thing, or vaccinate for rabies. Anyway, formaldehyde, ethanol, is, uh, they're largely resistant to... Um, and as I say, even formaldehyde for a very long period. So you're very careful about handling suspected cases of these. They can be inactivated by autoclaving, but it's much higher temperature um, for a lo much longer time than you would use for any other infectious agent that we routinely deal with. So again, this requires going beyond the norm in terms of autoclaving. Um, they're subject to bleach, but again, it's beyond the norm of the normal concentrations and the kind of time you would do. Uh, and some really nasty things like strong alkali. They are sub susceptible to proteases. Don't worry about these other protein denaturants, but uh, the fact they're susceptible to proteases was what gave us a clue that they might be protein. So they're protein, but they're very resistant protein, and it's really difficult to inactivate them. When you purify the infectious material, you find that protein is present, uh, and the protein is called PRP, um, and we'll come back um, to the PRP in a minute. Um, the proteases will inactivate it. Nucleic acid treatments 
that would inactivate nucleic acids don't inactivate them. So a large body of opinion is tending to favor the idea there is no nucleic acid. So you have no genome. So how are these things infectious? Come to that. But it's still controversial, although as time goes on, um, I think the evidence for protein only is accumulating and the evidence for nucleic acid is fragmenting. Um, but so what are the features of the disease? Um, it attacks primarily the central nervous system, has a very long incubation period. Once you get the disease, the course of disease is, is months or, or even into years. Um, you get this spongiform appearance in the brain you get vacuolation of the neurons. You get these uh, fibrils formed. You get this amyloid material. They form these plaques which stain with certain things. And it's pretty rare in man. So how can you have an infectious protein? Um, and what it's thought here is if we take this prion protein, PRP, uh, what we know is if you look at this protein in the disease cases, it's very resistant to certain things. So even though um, this is protease, res protease sensitive, uh, in the, disease, if the stuff you isolate from disease tissues um, is relatively resistant to protease. It's clipped a little bit, but it's relatively re resistant. So this was realized in sheep, and it was called, this protein was called SC for scrapie. It's still sometimes called SC, so that's why I've included it here. But uh, the more modern nomenclatures call it PRP resistance. So that's the stuff you find in the fetus material, and it's resistant. So why is, you can find this protein in normal material, and we'll come back to that. So you can find this protein in normal brain as well. So why is it that it becomes resistant? Well, this has got the same sequence as the stuff that is much more resistant. Um, and as far as we can tell, it's got all the same modifications. So it looks like it's the identical protein. Uh, but if you look at this and use the appropriate biochemical techniques, it's predominantly alpha helical in its uh, tertiary structure, secondary structure. So, but if you look at the secondary structure of this, it's primarily beta-pleated sheet. I remember this, that helical is happy and beta-pleated sheet is bad. So what it looks, what the suspicion is, is that this protein, when it's not causing a problem, is in this alpha helical form, and that something can cause it to attack this, uh, 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 undergo this conversion from the alpha helical form to the beta-pleated sheet form, in which it becomes even more protease resistant, uh, I mean, this is sensitive to protease. This is much more resistant. So how, does this, how can this be infectious? Well, the idea is that if you've got the good, happy form of the protein and the bad form of the protein, and they get together, the bad form can convert the good form to the bad form. So now this helical form is converted to the beta-pleated sheet form. And now, instead of one good and one bad, you've got two bad, and then they can go off and they can each recruit more good and convert that to bad. And so eventually, you can just trans start transforming all your good protein eventually to bad protein. It takes a long time uh, to this process to start and get going and accumulate enough bad protein to cause disease. But that's the hypothesis. So if somebody who's got none of this form around um, were to get this form in their brain, then it would start converting the good form. So, so how can you get this disease? And you can get it in multiple ways. One is spontaneously, as far as we're aware, some people would just develop this. There's no family history. There's no obvious um, cause in, uh, that for it. And so what we think may happen is some unfortunate people in their brain somewhere or other, at some time or other, this conversion just occurs by pure bad luck. And then once it's occurred, it will gradually start to uh, convert more and more and you'll come up with the disease. So there's a spontaneous conversion and you get sporadic cases. So these are not acquired by infection, they're acquired because this protein is one of your own proteins. This is coded for by the human genome. So, how can you acquire it if it's one of your own proteins? Well, the idea here is that 
If you've got this and you acquire it by a diet or in some other way, then if you acquire it and it gets to the appropriate place, presumably we think in the brain, uh, it will convert the good stuff in the brain and then the same process will go on. And so you can get acquired. And in fact, I mentioned a disease called Kuru, uh, and that was a disease that was a major plague uh, for some uh, Indians called Foray, the Foray tribe in Papua New Guinea. They lived way up in the mountains, and um, people were going because people were dying of this really awful disease. Um, in Kuru, you tend to present with tremors and trembling, and that's what Kuru refers to, this business about you're always shaking. Uh, but eventually, um, it just gets worse and worse. You, you get mental problems, you get physical pro problems of uh, muscle control and everything, and eventually it's lethal. Uh, they looked for everything, infectious causes, but it did seem that it was certain, uh, certain groups of people got it, the women predominantly. Um, and if men survive beyond a certain age, they seem to be protected against it. And to cut a very long story short, it turned out that what happened in this tribe was they would eat the ancestors, uh, they would eat people in their families or their villages who had died. They would eat certain parts of the body as a sign of honor to them to indicate that they thought they got a great brain uh, or a great heart or whatever. Uh, and also um, the people who were killed in battle against them. You know, these were great warriors and, and they, it, so it was, a, it was a kind of celebration, honorary funeral feast. Um, turned out the women prepared the stuff so they were handling this raw material, this raw brain material, raw bone marrow material, um, raw everything. Uh, this is probably, they got it from the brain material in this case, um, with the children, because of course they were looking after the children. Uh, so they were handling this stuff, and then they would prepare it for the feast, and the older people would eat it. Uh, and it turned out that the men tended to eat the muscle and the women were left the less favorable parts, which were the brains, apparently. So what happened was these people, you know, you got cuts and scratches and insect bites uh, and you're handling things and they were getting uh, infected with this stuff. Um, if the men survive, if they didn't catch it as a child and they made it through to adulthood, they were eating the cooked meat and they didn't seem to be at nearly as much risk as the people who were eating the brain. When this was discovered, the tribe were informed that you know, this was what the investigators felt was a the problem. They promptly gave up this practice. Uh, and after these uh, feasts ceased, nobody who has gone down with Kuru who didn't, wasn't exposed before the cease, cessation of this. So in other words, there's no evidence that people who w went to one of these feasts and then, say, 10 years later, had small infants breastfed them and then came down with the Kuru later on than that. There's no evidence that those people who were incubating Kuru at the time um, infected anybody who didn't attend these feasts. So there's no evidence that nursing, breastfeeding, uh, blood donation, anything like that uh, could transfer this. So acquired it seems to be by very particular routes. Also, you can inherit this. There are little familial forms of these diseases. Um, and what's thought there is that there's a mutation that changes one of your amino acids. And that if you've got this mutation, then it's much more likely in the course of your lifetime, these tend to be diseases of older age, uh, there's much more likely during your lifetime that this will gradually convert uh, some of the proteins to the bad form and then it will take off just like this. So you can inherit it. And in some families, it seems virtually everybody who gets the mutation develops it if they survive to middle late, late middle age. Um, in, other, in other families, it may not, the, the mutation may be less, penetrating, less penetrating. Uh, and also, um, you can also have the argument that you can have somatic mutation, which also makes this conversion more likely. So this wouldn't be an inherited disease. It would be, again, a version of the sporadic form. So what you see with these is this protein, as I say, it's one of your proteins, one of our proteins, um, and it, you can get the disease, but it is infectious once it's undergone this bad change. 
But the causes of the bad change can be um, an acquired bad form of it. But it does seem that if we acquire the sheep scrapie, it's very poor at converting our protein to the bad form. The bovine form seems to be rare, but more efficient than the sheep at doing it. Any questions on this? Yes, well, one thing is, the question is, if somebody eats these proteins, we've got proteases in our stomach, so is that protective? Probably. Um, now, they, as I say, the bad form is relatively protease resistant. We really don't know how we get it, but there is evidence that it goes through the lymphoid system to probably get to the brain. So it, it may be picked up by lymphoid cells and then get to the brain that way. Um, so... One idea is that, you know, you're probably relatively protected unless you've got cuts and other damage to the GI tract or to the buccal cavity. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's one of our genes. And we don't know how it transfers from one to the other. Um, and... If you remember back to all those graphs you get right at the big beginning of free energy graphs in biochemistry, you have this thing with enzymes, you know, that glucose can sit around on the shelf forever. But if you've got an enzyme that just twists it into the right form, the lower energy form is actually degraded glucose. So it seems that what we think is that this can just like with an enzyme, uh, that basically the... The bad form is more stable. So once you flip it, it becomes a more stable form. But when we make it, we assemble it as a, as a helical form because of chaperone proteins and one thing and another. And that, but the, the, it's only quasi-stable. If you put it in the right environment, it can flip into the bad form. Presumably, usually, that bad environment is rarely seen. Um, but occasion, otherwise, we would all go down with it by the time we got to be 70 or something. But it's pretty rare. Um, so probably these sporadic forms, it's just really, really bad luck. But some of them could be due to, to diet. Right. But if you remember, what, so the question is, you know, why doesn't the protein just always adopt the one secondary structure? Um, and one of the things is, you know, when these proteins are translated on ribosomes, there are all sorts of chaperone proteins that help them fold properly and keep them in the right form. And we also have, and that may not have been covered in your coursework, but we have a whole pile of systems that degrade badly folded protein because otherwise it just junks up the cytoplasm. So one idea is what we see of this may not be what the actual toxic form. The toxic form may be the intracellular stuff that is junking up the cytoplasm and, and stopping the regular cells doing their regular duty. A lot of unknowns here. We don't really know what its normal function is. So why are they different? And, and I've pointed out the more than one confirmation. I think we've gone through all this. Oh, I know. No, the point is here that we have different prion diseases. So we, we have different clinical presentations. Uh, and, why, and also those tend to breed true, which was one argument for why should this be. So when we look in the animal systems, if you've got something that causes the, the animal to die rapidly uh, and you use infected brain material from that mice to infect other mice, they will die with a similar time course. If you've got a slow one, the, the, the ones that are infected will die with a similar slow time course. So they sort of seem to breed true. How can a protein breed true? And that gets even more back to the question there about how do proteins have more than one confirmation. But it seems that this, even the bad form can have more than one confirmation. So what I've tried to show here is this can flip to this form here, this resi the, the more protease-resistant form, uh, by forming this kind of pleat or by forming this kind of pleat. Uh, and we can actually detect the difference between these, these days using certain uh, tricks, techno lab technology tricks. And so the idea is that if it flips to this form, it converts everything to this form, and if it flips to this form, it converts everything to this form. And so it looks like there may be alternate forms of the bad form, and that may possibly explain some of the differences in the clinical presentation. And so again, if you're going to have these two types of flips, you can have some mutations which might cause it to flip to the one form, 
and some that might be more likely to clip it to the, to the second form. So people who've got this might be more likely to go down with GSS, um, gerstmann streisler schenker or however you should pronounce it, syndrome, and these might be more likely to go with fatal familial insomnia. Um, so the disease seems to be also affected by exactly how they flip. I said it's the disease of, uh, of sheep. You see the same kind of things that you would see with anybody who's losing brain material rapidly. Loss of muscular control, a wasting disease, anorexia, and loss, lack of motivation, um, glial proliferation, vacillation of neurons, these plaques, uh, and this infectious material, which has got this funny property. But scrapie was originally heavily invested in, investigated in sheep, not because it wasn't really thought it was a human disease, but it was a serious disease of sheep, uh, and that was where a lot of the original stuff was done. Kuru, I've mentioned, uh, so I said it was a human disease. Here, typically the first symptoms are tremors, shaking, shivering. Kuru actually means shivering. Um, but it eventually leads to dementia and death, and you get all these same, these amyloid plaques, spongy form change, changes. And the big discovery was that if you took material from people with Kuru, um, you could actually show it was infectious. And in fact, you can take people with sporadic forms of these diseases, inherited forms of these diseases, uh, acquired forms of these diseases, and in all cases, the material is infectious. So even if you get a sporadic form, that brain material is infectious. What we more frequently see uh, in the regular population is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, named for the physicians who first reported it. Um, and that, funnily enough, more often presents with a dementia rather than with the, the trembling, with the, the muscular things. But eventually, you get the same, you get problems with muscular coordination. I'm not really stressing hugely which presents first because this is an average. So some patients with CJD may be more on the muscular side, some may be more on the, the um, problems with uh, uh, dementia side. Uh, but the average age is about 68 years in this country. And it's about 10% of it is familial, and the rest is sporadic. Occasionally, you can get acquired form, and, and that can be due to surgical uh, manipulations, uh, because in a way, that was what those women were doing in the highlands of New Guinea was surgical manipulations, particularly with the brain. This is a problem in neurosurgery. Um, so there are major problems. When this was realized, it's changed the way that neurosurgical instruments are handled. There's a tendency to use disposable far more than there used to be. Um, the means to uh, disinfect them is way more than it used to be. And even now, um, there are hospitals where it turns out they didn't think a patient had got any problem, and they used some kind of stereotactic electrodes, and they weren't properly cleaned or they, um, they weren't disposed of and they were used on other patients, and periodically you get these reports in the newspaper of people being informed that they may be at risk for this. So this is still a problem. It's even more of a problem with variant CJD, um, and I read the notes because I put it all in the notes, uh, but with variant CJD, it turns out that seems to hang out a lot in the peripheral lymph nodes. You don't find regular CJD in the peripheral lymph nodes, but with this variant, which seems to be due to this BSE from cows getting into the human population. You can find it in the adenoid material, in the appendix, in other tissues. You can also find, unlike with regular CJD, you can find it apparently in the blood. It's almost certainly being transmitted by blood transfusion, which is why they won't take my blood here. So they, I spent too long in England, and too long in England is something like 10 weeks in England and a few weeks in Europe, and they said, no, nope. uh, they don't want my blood. I might be going down with it. Given my misstatements this morning, we may be really, may be a major problem. Uh, but, um, so you have to be very careful from surgical techniques, particularly things that uh, are using brain. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, one of the things is, these are really expensive pieces of equipment, very delicate, uh, and, but as I say, the, the growing awareness has, has really changed neurosurgery. So for the classical form, there is no evidence for transmission by blood, by milk, by other body fluids, by intimate social contact. And, you know, it's pretty intimate social contact if you're nursing a family member 
who's gradually losing all their powers and muscular control and everything. And yet nobody's, there's no evidence that family members and close contacts of people with CJD have any increased uh, susceptibility. It's been transmitted by all sorts of things, neurosurgery, cornea, um, duramatographs. Um, those are now handled differently and um, there's a tendency to try and use anything else if you can avoid them. Um, and by hormones, because those used to be isolated from things like pituitary glands uh, post-mortem. And now, of course, with recombinant hormones, that's a major uh, loss of a risk factor, fortunately. This variant CJD, which is seen in Britain, but has been occurred in this country, um, apparently due to imported cases. The two cases in the US have both spent time in Britain. Uh, but it also occurs in other countries in Europe because the cows in other countries in Europe also got some of it. Um, the median age of death is only 28. So this affects people at a very young age. And they tend to present with psychiatric symptoms. So first of all, they go to see a psychiatrist. So this is another case. You've got a variant. And in this case, the variant seems to, to be um, attacking a different part of the brain. Uh, than you regularly see. So one idea is it depends how you get it and it depends exactly what form you get as to where the brain, the attack on the brain starts. And I've already said we have to be very careful because the evidence, there's evidence here that you can isolate the, edge, the agent from peripheral lymphoid tissues and from blood, which is really unusual. This shows the British outbreaks. This is just Britain. There's now 195 deaths worldwide from this, so it's not a huge problem. But the problem is that what we've seen is there was an, uh, the peak was around the year 2000. It seems to be dropping. We hope this is the end of it. But what you find is when you look at this gene, it's one of our genes, um, it has, we're, many people are heterozygous. Uh, and 37% of the UK population is homozygous for having methionine at 129. And yet 100% of the clinical cases so far have had methionine. So does that mean that the remaining 63% of the population is immune to this? Or does it mean that the remaining 63% of the population are susceptible and are going to go down with something else years down the road? So what we don't know is, is this the end or are we going to see a huge epidemic because there are far more people at risk for whatever this other disease is? So we're really concerned about this. Um, but what... You do tend to see in growth hormone recipients, for instance, there tends to be an excess of people with BV. So we don't know whether um, being heterozygous is good. Um, GSS tends to present with motor syndrome. It's often regarded as inherited subclass of CJD. Fatal familial insomnia, the fam it was always thought to be inherited, but there have been sporadic cases now. And it presents with problems in the circadian rhythm. It seems to go for the hypothalamus. One of our proteins, no inflammatory response, no interferon response, no antibody response, no cell-mediated response, no serology. So it's very difficult to know. And, and look at that. We do have antibodies which can be, can be raised in specially derived mice that can detect this protein. So we can actually um, use antibodies to look for this protein in infected in people who got, we think might have the disease. So there is an antibody test. But it's not, you can't test for their antibodies. They won't raise an immune response. So we can just use it for immune fluorescence type of, of studies. 